Golden Spiral Media presents The Blacklist Exposed. Hello, special agents. You have come to the right place. Welcome to The Blacklist Exposed. I am Agent Troy Heinrichs. We are here with a special edition of The Blacklist Exposed with our Season 1 Special Archive Episodes. The following episode appeared on the TV Talk Network for Season 1 of The Blacklist, and we're bringing it to you here on The Blacklist Exposed, remastered and used with permission from TV Talk. We hope you sit back, relax, and enjoy this special episode from Season 1. You're tuned in to TV Talk, The Blacklist. Welcome to TV Talk, America's number one TV talk show network. And now it's time for TV Talk, The Blacklist. After 17 episodes, all it took was Uncle Flippo's flashing butt to light the way to the truth. Welcome to TV Talk, The Blacklist. I'm Troy. And I'm Dave, here to discuss number 88 on The Blacklist, Ivan, airing March 24th, 2014. Hey, TV Talk listeners, amazing news. You can now get great rewards just for watching your favorite TV shows and listening to music. Use Viggle to check into any TV show or song and earn Viggle points. Redeem for music and movie downloads, gift cards, electronics, and more. Download the free Viggle app and start getting rewards now. So a doll that you would use to entertain a fourth grade class finally shines the light for Liz as to who her husband really is. We all knew it was going to come down to Uncle Flippo. I mean, we've seen this coming for episodes, haven't we? Well, I love the fact that it's just such something so off the cuff and off the wall that... Yeah, you don't even think twice about it until she goes into that garbage can at the end of the scene and you're just like, holy crap, it's Uncle Flippo. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you're right. I mean, when when you're first introduced to Uncle Flippo there at the beginning, it's just almost like a passing joke between between Liz and Tom. You know, it's just kind of a, you know, a little cutesy moment. Uh, Uncle Flippo takes a dark turn, doesn't he? And you're sitting there as they're talking about it in the back of your head going, oh, yeah, like he's going to bring Uncle Flippo to his fourth grade class, this psychopathic killer who's not really a teacher. I mean, if Liz only knew, and you're you're so focused on that part of Tom's character that you don't even think that this is going to be the red herring at the end of the day, right? It was, it was a it was a great reveal though when the when when that comes to play because you know as the blacklist loves to do, they take everything right down to the last minute of the show, and you're just wondering if Liz is gonna wake up and uh, and smell the hippo. She sees that it's literally what within the ten last ten seconds of the show. Wake when up, that happens. Yeah, wake up and smell the hippo. I'm wake, up, wake up and smell the hippo, lady. <laughs> oh, you heard it here first, guys. On TV talk, the blacklist. <laughs> so I have a question for you because I was trying to. I love the fact that Mr. Kaplan was back in the show this evening. You know, their relationship between her and Red is just absolutely fantastic. Even though, again, it's still Mr. Kaplan. But the bodies they found did it have any significance in the entire episode this evening? Well, I took it as I was watching. I took it Mr. Kaplan had found the graves of Jolene and the cowboy guy because they mentioned that there's two bodies, but we only briefly see one female body and it. It's kind of covered with dirt and kind of kind of messy looking. So you, you really can't get a great look. But I, I thought it was the two of them who, of course, you know, were taken out last episode. I could see that. Yeah, th- that might be true. And that probably plays into the fact why Red said, no, don't do anything with this. You know, let's just let the normal, you know, 911 call take care of, you know, finding the bodies and, you know, finding the crime scene and whatnot. So, yeah, I guess I could buy into that, that it was probably the two of them. And but that just doesn't seem like it would go with Tom's M.O. as far as his cleanup process goes, because you think he'd be more careful. But then again, taking into account his cleanup efforts at the at the clubhouse or warehouse, whatever you want to call it, his hideaway. Yeah, you know, he didn't cover his tracks very well there either. 
So well, he was kind of he was kind of in a hurry there. Uh, uh, the surprise visit by uh, his wife kind of threw things into a frenzy. Well, he was probably in a hurry too to get rid of the cowboy and Jolene because he had to get back home, obviously to Liz. So maybe right. he didn't quite you know get it all uncovered, and it wasn't that it wasn't that they were buried. Maybe Kaplan dug him up. It Red makes some kind of a, an offhand comment to Mister Kaplan about you're like a human bloodhound, and she says I've been called worse. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a great line. Uh, but I mean, yeah, that's pretty much the the extent of it. They don't they don't really spend a lot of time explaining it. However, Mister Kaplan found it, she found it, and Red says, "Put it back the way you found it." You know, we're not doing anything with this. Put it back the way it was when you got here, and then he calls nine one one. What I really liked is that opening sequence too this evening with the guy, and here we have like the lawnmower man or this new you know Johnny Depp movie that's coming out, Transcendence. If you want something more current where somebody's taking over the computers and the printers are going crazy and Ivan is flashing on the screen and yeah, you know, I'm a I'm a sucker for a good cyber terrorist type storyline. So this this was really up my game this evening. And then for them to be able to take over the actual computer chip in your car to deploy the airbags, I thought that was just ingenious. It was good. It was actually real reminiscent for me of the the Die Hard movie. I'm a big Die Hard fan, but not the last Die Hard movie, but the one before that. I can't remember what they called it. A good day to Die Hard. Yeah, man, yeah. and that was a, it was a cyber criminal thing. Same type thing. Our guy, you know, had the technology to to you know take over the electric grid and the gas grid and and all that. But the thing that was really nice about this opening was we really had no idea where we were when we were there. Were we in the FBI office? Were we, you know, where were we? It was obviously some type of a of an office setting, lots of computers and printers and fax machines. But uh yeah, things just kind of start going crazy and then all of a sudden we start seeing all the different cameras that are tracking this guy's movements as he's as he's trying to get out. Some confusion there at the beginning, but I think they were trying to show us the same confusion that this guy was feeling. Well, you know? it, and the question I always have is that you, you, you sanction these government projects, right? And the whole idea, obviously, is to either take down a foreign government or protect ourselves from a foreign government in case they were to develop something like this themselves. But anytime you build a device that's basically the skeleton key, as they called it, to the entire computer system, you know that that's just going to backfire on you. <laughs> it's never going to go well. And yeah, that's exactly what this is. We find out as the episode progresses that that office where they were at, where that guy was, and and that guy that uh, escaped, or I mean, he, you know, he leaves that after everything starts going crazy, he gets in a car, and you would mention that his car gets taken over, and uh, he actually ends up uh, dying. He ends up getting killed. And we, we find out that he's actually working for the NSA on something called the Skeleton Key which somebody has now stolen. Yeah, and I thought that was really interesting because I would figure something like this had to be more than one person, right? Because you'd have to have somebody monitoring the cameras, somebody you know, setting off the program to scare them at the office, somebody then to be the runner to grab the device. And here it's actually just one kid that's taking care of all of this. So kudos, you know, teaching these young ones, you know, well in school to start out with. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but we're led to believe at first that it's, that it's our, our title character. We're led to believe that it's Ivan. According to Red, the only person capable of, of doing something like this was Ivan. Ivan, I believe was what, 88 this evening. We've been in the eighties for a while. So, and what I thought was really different about this week's episode was that it had the same kind of mantra. It had crazy explosive opening, Shocking twist that it wasn't Ivan, it was actually this kid. And then there was some kind of development between Red, Liz, and Tom and that whole dynamic and everything. But we didn't catch the bad guy this week. No, no. Well, I think the the Tom-Liz storyline is kind of taking over a little bit. I mean, it's gotten to the point now where the Blacklister is almost second fiddle to the Tom-Liz storyline. Do you feel that, or is that just me talking? Well, I think that goes back to what we said said last time on the last episode of TV Talk, The Blacklist, where we said the first kind of, call it two-thirds of the season, right, because we're almost at episode 18, was really about using the Blacklist members to uncover Jolene to get to Tom. And now that we know who Tom is, I think you're right. I think the Blacklisters are going to be kind of like the second story to what's really going on now, which is exposing Tom and Tom's organization so Red can get his revenge. So you're right. But this episode here, the actual Blacklister, Ivan, is only in the actual episode. I mean, he's talked about at the beginning for a while. And of course, as always happens, 
Red knows where to find them. Where are they at? They're in Minsk, I believe. Is that not where we end up? Minsk? Minsk. Minsk? Yep. You know, Red Red really truly does seem convinced that, that Ivan is the the man behind this. And as it turns out, him and Ivan have a past, of course. And uh, Ivan managed to empty out a uh, a rather large bank account <laughs> a few years back. And Red's looking uh, to maybe uh, get some of that money back. Five million dollars plus interest. <laughs> and I love the fact that Red can actually work with the FBI to set up this whole game plan of, you know, we're going to bring these guys in and we're going to try to flush Ivan out. But he's really using them to his advantage again because this is the typical red mantra of, you know, I'll help you out, FBI, if I'm going to get something in return. And so, of course, as he's talking to Ivan there, he's like, well, I can get you out of here. And he's like, let me guess, for $5 million and some interest. <laughs> Classic. As he's trying to make this deal, the police just happen to show up outside the bar where they're at. So they uh, they retreat through the kitchen. And again, Red making his his typical uh, culinary observations as, he, as they're standing there and he's basically stealing $8 million from this man. He's commenting on the bouillabaisse. And, uh, you know, and, and that type of stuff. It's just funny the way he, he's so calm under pressure that way. But yeah, it, it turns out the whole thing is a big stage when they, uh, he gets the guy to transfer the money. They take off through the back door. And as they, as they round out to jump in the car, who's standing there but Rustler and Red just shoots him. Boom. Shoots him in the chest. Yeah. And I thought maybe he grazed his shoulder or something at first. And then I saw the blood and I was like, Oh man, he actually shot him. And I yeah, think he might be dead. <laughs> Yeah, it all turns out to be a big rude there. They're trying to get Ivan to play along. It was all, you know, obviously a blank and, you know, a squib. And they're like, do you, do you think he bought it? <laughs> so, uh, you know, now they, the Red's got the FBI, you know, playing charades with uh, with criminals for him. I thought at first I was like, OK, he's just going to shoot wrestler and it's 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 all a ploy. Right. But then when he didn't move for such a long period of time, I, would, I actually was like, maybe he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I actually bought it for like a second. I actually changed yeah. my original thought. And then Mirna walks around the corner and it's like, uh, yeah, you convinced me too. So it's like, good job. But good job, wrestler. But then we're on a plane with Red and, and Ivan. And Ivan admits that all this that's going on uh, with the skeleton key ain't him. He don't know who it is. He's like, I don't want any problems with the U.S. government. My my deal's always been with the Soviets. You know, I'm always trying to screw with them. I don't need uh, the Americans on my case. I've been trying to find out who's doing this, and I, I don't know who it is, but it ain't me. We're kind of done with Ivan at that point. Yeah, that, it, he just kind of disappears and kind of gets, you know, thrown to the wind so he can keep being a criminal mastermind. Maybe that's the plan all along, right? Hey, if he's fighting against Russia, he's on our team. So depending on how long uh, Blacklist runs, we could pay another visit to Ivan. He's he's still out there running around in, in Blacklist world. Well, now that would actually be a really interesting concept. You know, this is the first time I think we've actually heard or thought about that. Could we actually revisit some of these characters in later seasons? Because Technically, some of these characters Red's already revisiting from his past. So right. That's a really great idea. Maybe at the end, Ivan's got to come back and save the day. And we'll be there to talk about it when he does. Absolutely. <laughs> but what's funnier about this entire thing is that this one kid who's pretending to be Ivan, probably even a little bit better than Ivan since Ivan can't even track him down. He's doing this all because he has a high school crush. But I love how, how we get there because we find out... You know, the FBI and their infinite wisdom, they, they put two and two together. They track it down to an address. And when they visit the address, it had to do with social security payments. There was a, uh, a woman whose social security payment had changed. So they go pay this lady a visit. She's like, the lady's being kind of bitchy, quite frankly. She's just like, you know, she's like annoyed. She's being bothered about this, you know, and she's like, I can't believe you would think I'd have anything to do with anything like this. I need my grandson to help set my thermostat. And you can see the light bulbs go. Bing! <laughs> over the FBI heads. And that's how we're introduced to Harrison. We now know that it's the grandson of this woman. Well, and the great thing about it is that he's sitting there talking. The creepy scene of the night, let's go back to that. The creepy scene of the night was sitting at the lunch and he's watching this girl and he's literally mimicking every single thing she does as she bites the apple, as she bites her sandwich. You talk about stalker. That was just downright weird. Yeah, to watch really that take place. Creepy. 
you find out that this girl is actually the daughter of the guy who invented the skeleton key. I thought that was really interesting. Fisher was the name, right? Mr. Fisher. Mr. I believe, Fisher. Is the gentleman's yep. name. Yeah. So then all the pieces of the puzzle start start coming together. Well, and then the train sequence, you know, being that we were recording this, obviously, March 24th, 2014, freaked me out a little bit because I'm from Chicago. And those that might have seen some of the March 24th news about the train derailment in, at O'Hare, you know, this train, the subway is just starting to kick up the tracks and pick up some speed and here Lizzie is breaking through the window and jumping in while it's like in full motion. You know, talk about great acting skills and great acrobatic skills to do that. Kind of an intense scene. I was, I uh, was really impressed by the whole thing. And, you know, and uh, Lizzie staying calm, trying to talk this, you know, talking about how she thought it was so romantic that he, he had done all this, you know, basically shut down Washington DC, turned all the electricity off, you know, how romantic it was that, you know, he was doing this just because he liked this girl so much. But in the end, he still pushes her down and hits her head on the step, potentially thinking that he might have killed her. And then he takes off and runs. And then, of course, has this one on one conversation with Liz in the train about how, you know, you, you still change your, your fate basically. Right. And so he right. kicks on those brakes and you're like, Oh my gosh, why don't you? slow down the train and do the brakes. Why are you just doing the brakes only? Yeah, because he had this thing really rolling. I mean, this thing was doing a, a taking a Pelham 123 type thing. I mean, this this thing was chipping down the tracks and, you know, we're told through a series of radio communiques that, you know, there's only, what, 5,000 foot left of track left or something. And, uh, you know, they definitely play up that tension of, you know, will it stop on time? Can it stop on time? In the end, all is well. They do get it stopped. The girl gets reunited with her father in a special heart roaming, heartwarming blacklist moment. And I thought that was kind of a really telling scene too. The daughter is reunited with the dad. So we go then to have dinner with Tom because he's cooking as he usually does because Liz is always out and about. And there was a scene earlier in the evening where Tom is actually talking to his wife and I believe the line was something to the effect of, you can never know people, can you? And he was saying that to Liz, obviously, when they found out about Jolene. So it's like Tom is like literally telling her, you know, you can, you can't trust people. You don't even, even me, you know, so he's using this line. And then of course she is going through these pictures and then finds, you know, the hippo, Uncle Flippo in the garbage. And then we basically have her kind of break down and start playing back all of Red's conversations. So she goes and runs to Red, which is when we get to find out what Red's been working on this entire episode. He's been crafting something. We, we don't see what it is, but he's, you know, he's building this, this thing every time it comes. And she, you know, she's interested in it every time she's always says, you know, what are you doing? What are you up to? And, you know, he always just keeps kind of playing it off. But uh, again, a really nice little formula that worked through the whole show, kind of tied the whole show together. And then here in this last scene, we see that he's actually building a music box. And then earlier in the episode, she kind of is like the, you know, you're not going to tell me the truth and I'm done with you. I'm walking out of here like a daughter would be yelling at her dad. So now we're back to this whole is is red Liz's father. And so she sits down and then she hears this music box playing and she's like, man, I know that song. You know, and then all of a sudden we start getting the backflash of the fire. She talks about her dad used to hum that song and tell her that everything was going to be all right. And then she's like, you know, you're right about Tom. And she starts to break down. Red holds her. And basically Red just says, you knew, you knew this whole time. You knew the song. You knew about Tom and you knew. And she starts crying. And then Red says, everything is going to be all right. Right. She, he just basically repeats back the exact words, word for word, for what she just said her father used to tell her when while humming that song when she was upset. You know, it, it was interesting because I watched tonight's episode with a couple family members, and it was interesting uh, watching the different interpretations of this ending that we all walked away with. Well, I think it was the final line that Red said, right? Because not only did he say everything was going to be all right, then he says it again. It's going to be all right. My recollection is he said, you're going to be all right. I think he said it twice. I think it was what it yeah, was. He, that like, could he, be. Yeah, he finished Liz's statement, right? Like she was like, you knew the music. You knew that what my dad was going to say, which was everything was, is going to be all right. Right. And then he says, as he like, you know, strokes her hair there, he's like, it is going to be all right. So yeah. I think that's where the interpretation, I saw Liz was looking at Twitter, Get glue or TV tag and a bunch of other places, Z box. And they were all like, some people are like, Oh my gosh, we just got confirmation. You know, 
you know, Red's the father. This is totally it. You know, they just spilled it out. And I think you and I were talking before we recorded. Eh, you know, it's not yeah, they, spelled they out. Admit, they didn't admit to nothing. They actually admitted to nothing. They, uh, they certainly insinuated, much like Red likes to control people's actions and thoughts. I, I definitely think that we may be getting controlled here a bit to believe something that may not be true. But I don't know. I, that, that, it's what makes this show so great. And you know what really makes this show great? The fans. Because our talkback question tonight is for all of you. Did tonight's final scene confirm or deny Red and Liz's relationship? What say you? Answer this question right now. You can do it with the free TV Talk app for iOS and Android. Head on over to tvtalkapp.com to get the full TV Talk experience. Because we want to know, are you on the side of this confirms that Red is the father or are you on the side of Red is doing everything he can to basically rekindle a father-daughter relationship to make up for the one that he lost? I can't wait for the talkbacks this week. I, I, I really want to know what the fans think. And don't forget to head over to tvtalk.com slash win to be entered in the weekly prize drawing as well as share with all your friends on Twitter and Facebook that you listen to TV Talk and TV Talk The Blacklist. The show's not done yet. The talkback clips are coming up next. Go deeper into the mystery of The Blacklist with other fans just like you. We will talk at you again next week. Until then, I'm Troy. And I'm Dave, disconnecting myself from the grid so I don't end up on The The Blacklist. Blacklist. And now it's time for this week's talkback clips. We hope you enjoyed this special version of The Blacklist Exposed, previously aired on the TV Talk Network and used with permission. Until next time, I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. That's at Troy Heinrichs on Twitter. And if you want to learn more about me, just visit, well, about.me slash Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson. You can hear me talking about movies and TV on the Hollywood Outsider podcast, as well as remake this movie right We are available at TheHollywoodOutsider.com or on Twitter at H underscore Outsider. Be sure to subscribe, download the app, submit your feedback, but most importantly, keep yourself off of The The Blacklist. Blacklist. The Blacklist Exposed is a Golden Spiral Media production. Find more of our great podcasts at GoldenSpiralMedia.com slash podcasts.